Well, good evening, everyone. One, one, one. Seems like we're missing a few. Maybe they're just running behind, but uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and we'll begin our class. Heavenly Father, we come humbly bound in your presence. We give you honor. We give you praise. We, as we reflect upon this uh, day you've given us, just count the many, many ways that uh, you have blessed us with uh, wonderful weather, with the ability to, to do profitable work, friends, family, a place to come to where we can open up your word and discuss it uh, in its fullness and let it guide our lives so that we can walk in this world helping others see the fullness of what you intended for their lives. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for all of those wonderful blessings. We thank you for giving us uh, those opportunities, and we ask that you continue to bless us with doors that are open that we may walk through to, to bring many to you. Heavenly Father, we, we ask that you be with those of our number who are sick, having difficulties, struggling with spiritual things. We know, Heavenly Father, that life brings many challenges to us, and, and oftentimes we, we fail the test, or we, we feel that we fail the test and, and become desperate and feel that we're alone. Heavenly Father, may each and every one here be determined to reach out to those who are struggling uh, among us, encourage them and, and build their faith. Heavenly Father, we thank you most of all for your son who went to a cross and gave his life for ours. It's in his name that we pray, and amen. All right, we are still in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. We are nearing the end of the chapter, uh, and uh, just want to kind of touch on a little bit of what we talked about last week, and then we're going to move on to... Uh, our next uh, topic, uh, of course, we are doing the, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and uh, this particular section that we are in, Christ is talking about, uh, you know, exceeding the righteousness of the Pharisees, and in order to, you know, do this, um, and I guess we could go back a little bit further, uh, he, he talks about the kingdom, because uh, the Sermon on the Mount is uh, all about the kingdom and what uh, people uh, or those who will be members of the kingdom will be like. Okay, now, when he says kingdom here, he's talking about uh, a, a large idea uh, that is going to be inclusive of the church uh, on one hand. Uh, this is uh, about the most physical uh, his kingdom gets in the presence of uh, the called out, that is the people. Uh, you know, the building is not the church, uh, it's the people. Uh, they are the called out, uh, you know, followers of God. Uh, and uh, uh, the church uh, is uh, said to be his kingdom. Uh, but of course, there is that larger idea of the kingdom of all of those who uh, are saved uh, from the, you know, the beginning all the way until uh, the time that uh, Christ returns. Um, but uh, as far as our, uh, as far as uh, uh, our concern uh, is focused, uh, we're talking about the, the church uh, and Christ building the kingdom, which is uh, the, the church and how people in the church during this lifetime uh, should live. The Sermon on the Mount is basically uh, a, you know, how do you want to put it? Uh, it, it is a user's guide uh, to the kingdom, uh, if you want to kind of put it that way. Uh, it is our orientation to kingdom uh, living. Some people have called it uh, Kingdom Living 101. Um, so it's just the basics of what it means to be in the kingdom. And in his day, you know, the Pharisees would have been considered among the people uh, to be kind of the, the pinnacle, or at least in their own eyes, they saw themselves as the pinnacle of what it meant to be uh, spiritual. And Christ would come along and he would say, no, your righteousness has to exceed their righteousness. You, you have to do better uh, than them. And, and here's why. Uh, and he lists several reasons here, and they always come in the same form. Uh, you've heard it said in, in times of old, or you've heard it said in the past, uh, that uh, you shall not, or, or some statement like that, taken from uh, the Old Testament. And typically what those statements are statements that were used and abused uh, by those people who were in uh, that, those positions of power, Christ comes along and he says, but I tell you, uh, and he ups the ante. 
Uh, he says, you know what, you, we got to do better than that. We got to do better than that. It, it's not okay just to do everything else but kill somebody. You know, uh, you shall, you know, do no murder or not be a murderer. Well, you can do better than that. Uh, you can go back and you can cut it off at its source. Uh, the heart or the, the heart and the passion that wells up in the heart when we become, you know, angry and vengeful and wrathful and, uh, you know, all of those things. Uh, you can cut it off right then. Uh, cut off right then. So he, he gives these series of things. And the, the last two that we've been looking at have to do with, uh, you know, relationships. Primarily, uh, the marital relationship um, and uh, God's uh, kind of expectation uh, there. So if you turn over to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, uh, we want to begin reading, um, let's see, oh, I'm too far. We kind of want to begin reading at uh, verse um, uh, 31 and go through 32. We'll have a couple final comments and then we're going to move on to the next uh, area. Just before this, uh, Christ had the discussion about, you know, you, you've heard it said in old times, or you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman with the intention of lusting, you know, after her has already committed adultery, you know, with her. Uh, and then he gives that extreme exhortation to do whatever it takes to overcome that passion. You know, don't, don't be led into the habit uh, of, you know, uh, having that desire that consumes you for those who are the opposite sex. Um, keep that thing in control. Uh, keep it in control. Then he goes from there, which is kind of broad uh, in the male-female relationships, down to the specifics uh, of marriage. Uh, and he says in verse 31, it was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, lets him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries uh, a divorced woman commits uh, adultery. And the main uh, thing here is, and like we said last time, you, you know, we, we to spend uh, a full time explaining uh, all of the marriage, divorce, remarriage doctrine would take us many, many weeks. Uh, but we want to hit kind of the big points here. Christ is basically saying, look, in times past, Marriage was considered a light thing. You know, husbands would divorce their wives uh, for burning the toast, send them out into the streets, and then they couldn't take care of themselves. Uh, you know, so in steps God in Deuteronomy and tells them, look, if you're going to divorce your wife, then you need to give her a writing of divorcement, which basically frees her from the relationship so that she can go and be married to another man who can take care of her who can take care of her and provide for her. And again, we talked about how their society was very different. Women were very much dependent upon, you know, men for their living and, and uh, things of that nature. It's just a different culture. Um, and, uh, of course, we, we find that somewhat foreign, uh, if not very foreign, uh, because there are plenty of, you know, women who make it on their own uh, and, and uh, in our society and, uh, you know, do very well, if not better than uh, a lot of their male counterparts. Um, so we really don't understand the backdrop, uh, but they were dependent. Uh, just to kind of give an example, if you go back to the book of Ruth, you, you remember when Ruth and Naomi traveled back uh, to her, you know, homeland, you know, what did they do? Well, I mean, they were reduced pretty much to going and standing at the corners of the fields when farmers gleaned and picking up the things that fell off of the cart. Um, that's what they had to do. She was married. Um, she had kids, the husband died, the sons died, nobody was there to provide for her, so she was reduced to going to the field and picking up grain that fell off the wagon. All right, so very different society, uh, very different society, uh, but uh, nonetheless, that's the way it was. So God steps in and he says, look, you know, if, if you're going to do this, then in the very least, what you need to do is provide this writing of divorcement, which basically, uh, you know, tells the rest of the world, uh, that uh, it is okay for her, uh, it is okay for her to be remarried. Um, now, if you go over to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, he expounds on this a little bit more, and he says, you know, you, you've heard it said, and of course he, he details some of this, um, and of course uh, he's answering the question over there, can a man divorce uh, his wife for any reason? Um, and that brings up that, you know, point that we're talking about here. 
Uh, can it be for any reason? You know, can she burn the toast or, or uh, can she spend, uh, you know, a little bit too much money or, you know, can she, you know, wreck the car or, you know, I mean, whatever mistake that the, you know, ordinary person would make, can that be a source for, uh, you know, divorce? Uh, you know, um, is basically the question. Uh, and Christ gives an answer. Uh, and essentially points the Pharisee back to the beginning. He says, look, you know, God, because of man's foolishness, man's weakness. Uh, my kid's school's calling. Does anybody want to talk to him? All right. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, he, he says, uh, because of that, because of the hardness of heart uh, of mankind, um, I, I winked at those things. You know, I said, I, I, I gave him a right in a divorce, and so at least the women would be protected. Um, but from the beginning, it was not so. Okay, in other words, that's not God's original plan. God's original plan was one man, one woman joined together by him, you know, for life, let no man put us under what God has joined uh, together. Uh, so that's the big part of it. Uh, now, we tend to complicate things. You know, we, we tend to create our own, you know, scenarios and difficulties, and uh, it becomes a relatively difficult thing for us to navigate through. But uh, those things we'll have to kind of leave for another time. What we want to do is just draw out, like we did last week, a couple points. Number one, God puts a high premium on marriage. He does. Uh, of all the things he mentions here uh, as uh, being, you know, kingdom principles— Marriage is one of them. You know, marriage is one of them. This is one of the kingdom principles to live by. If, if you're married, you, you know, you need to, you, you need to uh, be committed in, in that relationship. You uh, need to be committed in that relationship, um, number one. Uh, you need to not take that relationship lightly. Uh, it should not be dissolved for any reason. You've got to take it serious. Uh, and it's just like anything else. You've you got to put work into it. You know, you got to put work in it. If you're not putting work into it, then, you know... It's going to fail, uh, and it's going to fail, and it's going to be your fault, okay? Uh, well, not always. Well, but that's one of those situational things. Well, that makes a good platitude, but that's not always the truth. No, well, I mean, I've known too many good people who... Just one day came home, spouse is gone. And they were doing everything right. They just left. Well, that's just it. So they say. So, you know, we can, we can take it a step further and assume, but you know what happens when we assume, right? Yeah, we, we tend to make ourselves look foolish. Think. Sure. Yeah, see, well, that's this is kind of what I'm talking about. You, you know, as far as the individual application goes, there, there are cases where Jeannie is right. It's both their fault. There are cases where, you know, no matter what one person does to try to make things good, the other one just won't hear it. And, and they're bound to, uh, to just, you know, make it go away. Um, you know, and, and each one of those has to be taken kind of situationally. And simply for the sake of time, you know, we're, we're not really doing that. Because I don't want to distract us from the main point here. Christ is saying, look, if you're a member of this kingdom, then one of the things that you've got to take serious, because they weren't taking it serious. 
You know, in the first century, it was not uncommon, and, and this is not my words, this is the words of, uh, I think it's either, I think it's Tacitus, but I have to look it up. Um, but, you know, an, a historian from, you know, around the area. But their estimation of the, the first, second, or third, you know, that part of uh, um, the century was that, you, you know, you could often tell the age of a young woman uh, by the number of marriages that she had. You, you know, um, they were, divorce was abundant. Uh, divorce was abundant. Abandonment was, you know, plentiful. Um, and, you know, so I mean, it's we, we look at our day and age and we think, man, marriage has really been cheapened and it, people just don't take it serious. And, you know, we have organizations that have been created called like Focus on the Family and others that have spun off from it. And those are all great things. Uh, but, you know, it, it's been like that for a while. You know, people have gone through periods where they have appreciated marriage and they did take it serious. Uh, but then there have been times when that's not the case. And it certainly wasn't the case in Jesus' day and age. I mean, look at, look at his conversation with the woman at the well. How many times has she been married? Yeah, multiple times, five times, right? And the person she was with, uh, living with, wasn't even, she wasn't even married to. Uh, you know, and I imagine that that was a pretty common thing, just based on what historians say. Um, so marriage was not uh, appreciated uh, like it was. And truly, uh, Christ uh, is right when he says, look, there, there was a time of ignorance here. That there's a time in which God winked at these things. In, in other words, he tolerated them. Uh, but that time's over. That time is done. We are now going back to that original model. You know, one man, one woman put together by God for life. Let no man put us under what God has put together. Uh, that's his model. Uh, and, um, you know, in, here in chapter 5 and, and then chapter 19, Christ spells that out pretty clearly. But again, uh, to get the main point is, is that you got to take it serious. Uh, because why? Well, because... Your, your salvation depends depends on it. You, you know, it, it's not, well, we just didn't get along and all of it, but we parted and, you know, we like each other now. Well, that's great. That doesn't take away the sin. That doesn't, uh, you know, absolve you uh, of the, the sin that you committed in, in either doing uh, those things or, quite frankly, falling victim uh, to some of those things. There are plenty of people who do not want to be divorced, and yet they, they're divorced. Because we live in a world where I don't think a single state in our union now um, is anything but no-fault divorce. I think every single state is no-fault now. So basically, you file paperwork, and as long as you wait long enough, it's going to go through. And it doesn't matter who's at fault. They don't care. They don't care. Uh, they care more about, you know, the money attached to it than they care about certainly spiritual condition. Okay? But, you know, it's, uh, it's one thing you have to take serious because your soul may depend on it. Uh, your soul may depend on it. Uh, and uh, you, you got to do better than these people were doing in the first century. You got to do better uh, than, you know, what these priests and what these people uh, were promoting uh, based on a perversion of the law. You had a whole group of people following one rabbi who, who came along and said, yeah, it's okay to divorce your wife for any reason as long as you give her that paper. If you give her that piece of paper, you know, it's all good. It's all good. Um, really? You know. Wayne? Sure. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, it it um, 
So many times the, the marriage relationship is equated to the relationship we have with God. And of course in the New Testament that means via his son. Um, so if we're not going to be faithful over here, why would we ever be faithful over here? You know, if we can't be faithful to the person that we live with, why would you be faithful to a God you can't see? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you know, yeah, good point. But I've always thought of Malachi as, uh, you know, God's kind of shotgun blast into the realm of uh, sexuality because he hits it all. You know, I mean, you know, in order to commit adultery, um, you, you have to commit fornication. Okay. I mean, fornication is the broad term that just means sexual perversion, and, and inside of that is uh, adultery. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're hitting just about everything. You're, you're hitting adultery, you're hitting fornication, you're talking about in the lack of faith, uh, even down to the spiritual uh, commitment that we have with God. So it's kind of this shotgun blast that sort of hits uh, a multitude of, you know, areas uh, when it comes to the simple notion of faith. And that's the other big point here. Uh, that, you know, it's all about faithfulness. It's all about faithfulness. Uh, I mean, you know, we hear the horror stories from time to time uh, about, you know, dutiful wives or, or supportive husbands who, you know, labor, you know, many, many years. And I mean, they're not perfect. Nobody is, you, you know, but, uh, you know, they, they try their best to, to do things. And one day, boom. I mean, literally, I, I've known... In, in my own life, one of them in my own family came home and all the stuff was gone, you know, uh, and um, they had no clue. Uh, they had no clue. Uh, and uh, it just, boom, it, it just ended. Uh, and um, yeah, it happens a lot more than, than you think it does. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes people leave and they have a right to leave. You know, so I'm not saying they don't, uh, but uh, sometimes people leave and they, and they have a right to leave. Uh, sometimes people don't, and uh, sometimes people leave and they don't uh, have a right to leave. Uh, but, um, you know, how, re- how committed are we? How committed are we? Um, now, don't mistake what I'm saying here. Um, you know, the, the wife who comes home every day only to have her husband get drunk and beat her up, you're not showing your commitment by staying there okay um, that's just yeah uh, that's that's just not a good thing well we might disagree on that one but that's okay we're not talking about that we don't have to agree on everything but uh, you know Anyhow, all that being said. There you go. There you go. I mean, if if the husband is loving his wife like he's supposed to, then hopefully the wife will submit like she's supposed to and vice versa. Yeah. So anyhow, Christ is saying, look, you got to up the ante here. We got to do better. We got to do better. Uh, and in the history of humanity, we've seen better at times. Uh, we've seen eras where people did appreciate marriage more. And, uh, you, you know, it waxes and wanes in, in our own country. Um, right now, unfortunately, we're going sort of through a period where uh, people just aren't getting married. Uh, they're not getting married. Uh, a lot of millennials just aren't getting married at all. Uh, they're just really, uh, the, the whole 70s notion, notion of kind of, what was the term they used? Huh? Shacking up? Was that, the, was that the thing? Unfortunately, that's kind of coming back a little bit based on recent stats. Um, but marriage rates are down somewhat. Uh, not that people, you know, should rush to get married. Not saying that. But, you, you know, you can't be out here uh, living in your fornication and expect that that's okay either. But um, anyhow, God just simply says, look... These sexual matters, your marriage, the commitment you have in it, those are all important things that really can put your soul in jeopardy if you fall short of them. Uh, And unfortunately, many people will, you know, find that out the hard way. But uh, let's skip down to the next section. No, I mean, it's just like any other command. 
If you break the command of God, then yes, your soul's in jeopardy. You know, I mean, you're married to a man, you've been married to him for 25 years, he cheats on you, you have a right to divorce him according to the Bible. Okay? You come home one day and he didn't wax the car like you told him to, you divorce him, sorry, you're wrong. You see what I'm saying? All right. Okay, let's go to the next section. Uh, next one is about oaths, which kind of plays into it a little bit. Uh, because, um, you know, oaths here, some versions use swearing. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the language in just a minute. But the modern equivalent uh, to what he's talking about here uh, would be making a promise. Uh, making a promise. Um, we just don't talk like, I swear by the, so the, the we, we just don't talk like that anymore. Um, you know, so let's read the text first. <clears throat> 38 through 42. What's that? Uh, Matthew 5. I'm sorry, and it's 33 through 37. Again, you have heard it, uh, you've heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, um, <clears throat> or by earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city uh, of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Okay, so it's pretty clear, the language here. Some versions say swearing, some versions say oaths. Uh, I don't think any version says promise, but that's really what he's talking about. Uh, if you promise to do something, if you enter into an agreement to do something, then you need to do it. You need to do it. Um, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Notice he says, you shall not swear falsely, but perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Okay, so this is all about the follow-up. When you say you're going to do something, do that something. Okay? Uh, now, are we talking about in, you know, all things here? Well, I would think that that would be the case, that, you know, we would strive to always... Um, do the things that we say we're going to do. Does that always happen? Well, no. I mean, if it's five o'clock in the afternoon and you call me up and I'm in Seminole and you're over here at the, you know, uh, the, the, the Walmart on 19 and, the, and I say, well, looks like I'll be there in maybe 15 minutes. It ain't going to happen, is it? Ah, forgot traffic. So I'm there in 25 minutes. Does that mean I've sinned and broken this commandment? No, I, I think we're talking about things that, um, you know, it's, it's not a misjudgment here. I'm not misestimating time. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, misjudging some, uh, you know, agenda. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, making a mistake. Uh, I'm talking about, you, you know, <clears throat> fulfilling uh, the, the promise that I have the ability to fulfill and yet simply choose not to. Okay, I'm not talking about circumstantial things happening. You know, you're on your way here and you have a flat tire. Man, I promised I'd be at church tonight. Now I'm a sinner. No, I don't think that's the way it works. Uh, that's not the way it works. Uh, you know, sometimes things happen. And mainly what he's talking about here is you may recall, uh, we, and we talked about this a little bit with another lesson, uh, that the Pharisees um, had created among the Jews this almost system uh, of taking oaths or swearing by things. Oh, I swear by the temple, uh, or oh, I swear by Jerusalem, or, or I swear by these things. Um, and one of the one that's mentioned in the scripture uh, is uh, the, the swearing of the money to the temple. Um, but it really was just an excuse not, for kids not to take care of their parents. Okay, uh, you know, um, people w would, you know, uh, mom and dad would get old. Uh, get old and someone would need to take care of them. 
you know, taking care of them takes money, right? It did then, it does now. Uh, so who's going to pay that bill? Dad can't go out and work the field anymore. You know, mom can't make the, you know, the, the silk blankets or whatever she did anymore. Uh, so, you know, they can't support themselves. Where's the money going to come from? Uh, well, kids would say, well, not in the first century. You know, not in Jesus' time. Hey, they, huh? Well, today it would, you know, at least in part. Uh, but, um, you know, the kids would, uh, you, you know, if they were trying to do the right thing, they would, they would say, fine, you know, we're, we're going to take care of you. Uh, and uh, there are uh, passages where Paul was writing to the young evangelists, Timothy and uh, Titus, and he tells them, look, you know, don't, don't be so eager to take widows into the church. You, you know, rather let their families take care of them. You know, their families have a response, their children have a responsibility to them. You know, let them step up and take their responsibility uh, and, and be the, the kids they're supposed to be. Um, and it's kind of the same thing when Jesus is talking about. But what people would do is the kids would come along and they would say, oh, look, I've sworn my money to the temple. You know, uh, so I can't use it to support mom and dad. Sworn my money to the temple, um, so I can't, you know, support them. Well, all the while, it, it's, they didn't give any money to the temple. They just swore it to the temple. Okay? So it's not like they didn't have the money. The money was there. Uh, they just simply said, well, it, you know, it's, it's dedicated to something else. It's dedicated to the temple. Um, and it was just an excuse for them to get around God's command. Uh, so there was a bunch of things like that. Uh, and Christ comes along and he tells them, look, you, you know, you, you got to be better than that. You, you got to be people of your word. You know, when you, when you say you're going to do something, you, you know, you do it. Now, if you're like me, you, you tend to let little things kind of filter out. Now, Brother Wayne experienced this. He asked me to announce something, put it in the bulletin. Missed it. Totally missed it. Had to go apologize to him. You know, I just forgot. It slipped my mind. Okay? Life happens, right? Um, but, you know, it wasn't intended. Here, it's intended. You know, I'll swear by this. I'll swear that my money's going to go to the temple. And none of that money going to the temple. None of it is. There's not even the first intention for that money to go to the temple. Okay? When, we, when the words come out of our mouth, we know they are lies. Okay? That's what we're talking about. You've you got to be people of your, your word. You've you got to be honest. You know, it's kind of like when you go back to the, to the Psalms, um, really the Proverbs more, uh, and they talk about uh, you know, uh, measuring your measures with honest measures or weighing your weights with honest weights. You know, um, uh, people would uh, you know, hollow out their weights. Uh, you, you know, so 10 pounds becomes 5 pounds. So by the time you weigh it out, it looks like, well, this is 20 pounds of grain. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, um, not even close, not even close. And, but they would rip people off that way. But it's the same thing here, only in a verbal sense. Uh, you know, only in a, in a commitment sense. Wayne. Oh, you mean like, uh, I swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Uh, yeah, well, how's it go? So the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Uh, quite frankly, I think it's redundant. Well... Yeah, but I think swearing in that sense is the same as the here. You're just making a promise. I promise to tell the whole truth. You know, so you're promising, and you're not really promising, you know, to God. I mean, the whole idea of laying your hand on the Bible, I don't think anybody does that anymore. You know, uh, some people had problems with that, and I, I, I don't know. Personally, I think it's redundant. Uh, I mean, you know, are you going to tell the truth? Yeah. I, I mean... The person knows whether they're going to tell the truth or not, right?
Right. Yeah, but what, what? Yeah, but I, well, you, you've noticed that as humanism has come in, that phrase has been eliminated. Right. I mean, because they don't want any recognition of God, you know. But my question would be, and, and I'll be honest with you, when I hear it, my first question is, what does that even mean? So help you God. Does that mean, see what I, because my first thought is this, that if I lie, you, you know, only God is going to be able to help me um, because it's going to be bad, you, you know, uh, or it's going to be between me and God. I, I don't perceive it as me somehow, you know, swearing upon God um, because to me that's even more hard to define. I, I don't even know what that means. You know, it's like people who say, I swear on my mother's grave. What does that even mean? I, I don't know what that means. I don't, okay, you're swearing by mom who passed away. I, I mean, how does that somehow bolster your claim? You know, I don't, I don't get it. It's, it's kind of a dumb saying, you know. Uh, but um, I, 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 my first question would be, well, what exactly was intended when that phrase was used? Do they mean that, you know, so help you God, meaning that, you know, if you lie, then you're accountable to God because God knows and only God knows? Because if, if that's what it means, then okay, I'm all for it. Uh, if somehow it's profaning God, well, then certainly we'd be against it. Uh, but my first in inclination is to think it means, so help me God, in the sense that God knows and God will hold me accountable. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, but isn't it kind of funny that people who say this, I mean, you go here, if you go here and you read, now let's go read it again. You've heard it said of old, you shall not swear falsely, but perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Okay. There's two phrases there. Perform to the Lord what you have sworn. That's a positive, you know, statement. You know, okay, so swearing there is okay, but don't swear falsely is not okay. I don't know how you get any clearer than that. I mean, you know, we can't swear. Now, swearing is not cussing or cursing. You, you know, obviously, you know, that would be considered coarse jesting, rough language, you know, and uh, the Bible talk, t talks about that in several other places. Uh, but here, it's making an oath with the intention of never fulfilling that oath. You know, if you make an oath to God, God you know, and people do this, right? God, if you just get me out of this, uh, I'm going to do this and this and this and this, and they never do. But hopefully they do. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically it. If you're going to say it, make sure you're, gonna, you're willing to do it. Don't say it with no intention of doing it. You know, and, and we know what that's like. I mean, how many times have you, tell, have you had people tell you, oh, yeah, man, I'll do that for it, and they never do it. And the first time, you just kind of chalk it up to, ah, they just forgot. But then as you have a history with them, you realize that's just who they are. They never do anything they say they're going to do. And you don't want to be that kind of person. No. You really want to have the reputation of the person who doesn't hold true to their word? Yeah, that's not a good reputation to have. Exactly. And that's a good thing to point out, Jeannie. You're right. It's true in the marriage thing. It's true in friendships. It's true in all those. Yeah. So let's end on that point. Thank you, Jeannie.
Good evening to everyone. It looks like it may be a little wet outside going home, but uh, I think we're all waterproof enough to make it. Parroting is packed with challenges. I heard a guy once describe that bringing up kids was like trying to nail jello to a tree. Not only that, but kids ask the darndest questions, like, why can't I have another puppy? Like, you got married at 18, why can't I? Like, Daddy, what's Viagra? <laughs> Such questions cause us to stutter and stammer, but they pale in comparison to the one that most parents have been asked every time they go on a trip. And that is the question, how much further, Daddy? Give Dad the dilemmas of geometry, just don't make him answer how much further is it. It's an impossible question because how do you speak a time and distance to someone who has no idea what time and distance is? Now new parents, they assume that facts will suffice. So they say something like, it's 250 miles. Now what do miles mean to pre-K kids? Absolutely nothing. So the child asks another question. What is 250 miles? At this point, you're tempted to get technical and, expl and explain that one mile is 5,280 feet. So if you do the math, 250 miles equals 1,300,000 feet. But after you get only four words into your explanation, you've lost the kids. They sit quietly, and then when you're done explaining, they ask, yeah, but how much further is it? The world of youngsters is delightfully free of mile markers and time clocks. You can speak of minutes or miles, but a child has no hooks to hang a hat on when it comes to that. So what do you do? Well, Chris and I used to try to be creative. When our kids were small, they loved to watch Winnie the Pooh movies. So Chris and I used the length of those movies as a scale, and we would say something like, about as long as it takes for you to watch Winnie the Pooh three times. And for a few minutes that seemed to help because they're trying to ponder how long that would be. And sooner or later they asked that same question again. And then sooner or later we would have to say, you just gotta trust me. You enjoy the trip and don't worry about the details. I'll make sure we get there okay. And we mean it. We don't want our kids to sweat the details, so we make a deal with them. We say something like, we will do the taking, you're gonna have to do the trusting. Does this sound familiar? Well, not only the experience with the kids, but even in the Bible, Jesus has said the same thing to us. Just prior to his crucifixion, he told his disciples that he would be leaving them. And he also told them in John 13th chapter, where I am going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later on. Such a statement was bound to stir some questions and so, you know, we can always count on Peter. He spoke for the others and said, Lord, why can't I follow you now? Now, I'm gonna tell you Jesus' reply, but I want you to see if you can hear a parent's voice talking to his children, okay? Jesus replies, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. There are many rooms in my father's house. If it were not true, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and then I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may be where I am. Isn't that like you do the trusting and I'll do the taking? 
A good reminder for us, isn't it, when it comes to anticipating the return of Christ. Because for many, the verb trust is not easily associated with his coming again. It's a fearful thing. Our pre-K minds, when it comes to eternity, are ill-equipped to grasp a world with no boundaries of space or time. We don't have the hooks to hang our hats on when it comes to that. Consequently, our Lord takes the posture of a parent. You do the trusting, and I'll do the taking. And that's precisely what the message is in John 14. You can reduce all that is said there in just two, in just two words. Trust me. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me. So let's not be troubled about the return of Christ. Because for the Christian, the return of Christ is not a riddle to be solved or a code to be broken or something to be feared. Instead, it's a day to be anticipated a day to look forward to. And Christ reassures us that he has ample space for all of us. He says in verse two, there are many rooms in my father's house. Heaven is not like this world where we may have heard things like, there is no room for you in my place of business. Or we don't have room for you on this football team. Or a spouse that says, I don't have room in my heart for you anymore. And most sadly, I hope we never hear it from our church. Something to the effect, you have made too many sins. So therefore, we don't want you at our church. Some of the saddest words that people have heard is we don't have room for you. Jesus knew the sound of those words. He was still in Mary's womb when the innkeeper said, I'm sorry, we don't have any room for you. When the religious leaders accused him of blasphemy, weren't they shunning him by saying, we don't have room for a self-appointed Messiah in this country? And then when he hung on the cross, wasn't the message one of utter rejection? We don't have room for you in this world anymore. As we continue through those verses, there's another significant part that says, I have prepared a place for you. Jesus knows exactly what we need. We needn't worry about getting bored or tired or weary. He's preparing the perfect place for you. There's an author whose name is John MacArthur, and his definition of eternal life is something that I like. He says, heaven is the perfect place for people who have been made perfect. Trust the promises of Christ that he has ample space created for all of us. Trust Christ, I have prepared a place for you. And one last commitment from Jesus, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I'm going. And that's what this is all about. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in Jesus. There's plenty of room. And one room, especially for you. And he's coming back to get us. So today, tonight, this very minute, how are you going to respond to these wonderful, encouraging words of Jesus? At this very moment, he is going heart to heart, asking if he might enter. Yet more often than not, he hears the words of the Bethlehem innkeeper. I'm sorry, it's too crowded here. I don't have room for you. But every so often, Jesus is welcomed. Someone throws the door open to their heart and invites him in to stay. 
And to that person, and to that person, Jesus gives this great promise. Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms, and I have prepared a place just for you. And I am coming back to get you. Is there any room in your heart this evening for Jesus? Are you ready so that he is coming back for you? If you are not ready, we ask you to come to the front and get ready while we stand and sing. <laughs>